Hey everybody, this is Kelly from Central Ohio DNA Interest Group. Um, I'm recording the, uh, the presentation that we did in December called Using Tools to Organize DNA Results. Um, when I came and talked to your group, I think the number one thing that people were hoping to figure out is what's the best way to organize and deal with all this data and all the information that I have so that I can make use of it for um, for my research and I can break through brick walls and I can determine which segment comes from which ancestor so I can work with all my cousins. There's a lot to keep track of. So let's get started talking about some of the things that, um, that we're gonna cover. Uh, first of all, this stuff is hard. <laughs> um, it's not hard to do uh, DNA analysis necessarily, but to get it organized, sometimes you don't feel we don't we don't know enough. Sometimes we think we're not, just not good with technology. So do the parts that you think you can and try and start and do that continual education. Keep coming to the DNA interest group meetings. Uh, keep uh, watching webinars and being involved. Join Facebook groups. Be uh, involved with the latest tools. It's simpler than you think. If you can copy and paste, if you can see patterns, and if you can email your matches, you got this. Um, don't let things like Excel or Google Sheets or any of that intimidate you. There are classes at the library um, in at Westchester in the Midpoint Library. Uh, they do have a computer class for spreadsheets. So check out your local library system and see if they have something available where you can learn how to use a spreadsheet and some of the basics. You really only need five or six different um, components there and you'll be able to do all of this. Uh, when you don't know how to do something, Google it and we'll talk about that in a little bit as well. But there are some important vocabulary words to learn. I've listed them here. Um, that have to do with uh, DNA analysis. And there are some third-party software tools, GEDmatch being one of them. Um, and I think it's really great to think about GEDmatch in terms of the benefits, working with people who are interested in what you're interested in. So when you email them, when you correspond with them, you're, you're most likely going to hear back because they're at the same level of interest you are. You can also access results from all the different testing companies. There's actually more than three testing companies that upload there now. So um, I believe that uh, MyHeritage is uploadable now and there are a couple others. And then they have some really great tools on the free side, but they also have um, a $10 a month tier one membership where you can use some of their pay tools that are absolutely amazing. And we're gonna talk about one of the pay tools tonight, the segment matching tool. Your handout includes instructions and how-tos. So tonight is about the bigger picture, what can be accomplished. Um, the, there are classes for all of these, there are videos online. You can Google your software using the year to find out what you need. So if you wanna know like, for example, how do I delete a row in Excel 2010 for Mac? You can put that into Google and it will take you right to a place where you can read a little blurb and figure out how to do it. So include the software that you're using or if you're using Google Sheets and the year of the software and then whether it's Windows or Mac and you should be able to find very quickly um, how to do what you need to do or what you're confused about. So why should you use Excel for DNA matches? There are several benefits of using Excel for your matches. Most of you have matches either on Ancestry or Family Tree DNA or any of number of sites, including GEDmatch. And one of the frustrations that I have with the matches that are on those sites is the searching features. And for me, for example, on Ancestry, if I wanna view my matches, I have to go page by page by page. And it's very time consuming. And pretty soon I'm kind of down in the weeds and I forget which page I was on. So the benefits for me for Excel is that it's searchable. You can paste all that information in and build a spreadsheet using all of your cousin matches. And then as you have new ones, you can add new ones to it, but it's a great way to get started with some bulk analysis. Actually, the number one reason that I use Excel is because it's accessibility features. I can make the fonts larger. I can see patterns in large amounts of data. 
I can color code and track. And what I really like about it is that I use it as a tool so that when I walk away for a few days or a few weeks and I come back to it, I know exactly where I was in what I was doing. I don't have to go back and try to figure out which cousin I was working on. I can write notes to myself and color code what I've already found out. Also, I can sort it, and that's probably one of the major things um, with sorting, I think that's really uh, an important feature. I can sort mom's family, dad's family. Once I get to the point where I have made some progress there, I can sort by grandparents or great grandparents. I can sort by knowns or unknowns in terms of if you're looking for adoption. Um, maybe you know bio mom's family, but don't know bio dad's family, for example. You can sort by known and unknown. So you can tag those, you can color code those and make progress. In, in recognizing patterns. I really enjoy um, using some of the tools that are available to download DNA matches. So we're gonna go through some of those. Um, from Ancestry, you can download your DNA matches by using what's called Ancestry DNA Helper, and it's in the Chrome Web Store. If you're not familiar with the Chrome Store, Chrome is a browser that's owned by Google and Chrome browser has a store with extensions in it. So those are basically things you can add on to your browser that make things easier when you're searching and using your browser. So if you don't have Chrome browser, that's where you wanna start. You can download it for free. So it's very similar to um, Microsoft Edge or Internet Explorer, Firefox, Opera. You know, it's a large number of browsers out there and I actually use all of them. I just use them all for different reasons. Um, so I actually have all of them downloaded because I like Firefox for some things, I like Opera for some things, and I like Chrome for others. So if you're um, planning on using this app, it does need to be, or this extension, sorry, it does need to be in the Chrome browser. And so you will have to look at Ancestry within the Chrome browser. So you go to the um, Chrome store and you want to search for extensions called Ancestry DNA Helper. And I've shown a picture of it here. And then once you add it to your browser, it'll show up with that little green banner in the top corner that says added. So you'll know right away that you did it right. So you wanna look for this symbol in Chrome. This is just the upper right corner of my Chrome browser and it has a little DNA strand there. So once the extension's been added, there isn't anything else for you to do. What it will do behind the scenes is it will populate certain things within your Ancestry account. So you don't have to do anything special. It'll just automatically be there when you open. So if you open your Ancestry account, what it'll look like is it'll add these little green boxes that are over on the right hand side for scan, resume scan, retry skipped matches, download matches, and download ancestors of matches. That will show up on in your browser. So if you manage your DNA profile, but let's say you also manage your parents or your children or your couple of cousins, you any of the, the kits that you manage will have this functionality. So it'll, it'll work with any kit that you open within Chrome browser. So that's a really cool feature. Um, if you click on download matches, you'll be able to generate a spreadsheet of all of the matches that you have on Ancestry at that particular time. So you can open the Ancestry in Chrome browser, you click on download matches, and I will warn you, the scan could take some hours depending on your browser um, and depending on your speed of your network and depending on a lot of other features, how much uh, processing speed you're using and some of those other things. So it could take a while, but it's no problem if it gets interrupted. You can resume it if it gets interrupted. So what we'll download is what's called a CSV file, a comma separated value file, which is a type of an Excel file. So you want to change it to Excel and it'll ask you if you want to do that. You just say, yes, you want to do that. But this is kind of what the file looks like. Um, once you clean it up with just a smidge, um, there are some things here that we're going to talk about um, how to make it a little bit more user friendly. But you can see I've redacted a few things here. But what shows up is 
what's in black. And what I've added in red are relationships. So my dad and my mom and my daughter and my son and that sort of thing. So those things in red, I've added myself. So that's another benefit to, um, to having it in Excel. You can identify as particular people, you can color code, but what it shows you is the test ID. It gives you the name of the person, whoever's the administrator of the account, how many people are in the tree, what's the relationship range, and so on. So it gives you all of that data that's in the Ancestry uh, interface, but it gives it to you in, in a spreadsheet format. You can customize it. So if you don't like the way it looks, you can change the fonts. You can increase the font size. Uh, you can zoom in on it, zoom out on it. You can move rows. You can remove rows. Um, you can wrap the text and you can freeze the top row to keep the column, the headings of the columns as you scroll down the list. So let's talk about a couple of those things. This is just some screenshots on how you can change the font or the font size. Uh, for me, I prefer the fonts that aren't so fancy. Um, they don't have as many curly cues and all of that, very legible. So you can choose um, to change the font or font size by choosing the whole sheet. So you can see here on the screen, there's an arrow pointing to this little tiny triangle. That's where you can click on that little triangle and you can change everything in the whole spreadsheet all at once. So you don't have to do row by row or column by column. You can choose the entire spreadsheet. So what I do is routinely, as soon as I have this data, I will choose the whole spreadsheet. I will change it to a font I like. I will choose it, change it to a size that I like. And I can also change the size of what I'm looking like at by dragging the bar at the bottom of the spreadsheet. And I've included a little screenshot here so that you see what that looks like. You can highlight rows um, to add them or delete them, or you can highlight columns to add them or delete them. You can see here, if you click in this very dark section, the banner section where it has A, B, C columns, and it has one, two, three, four rows, you can click in that and it'll highlight the entire row or the entire column. So you can delete a row, you can insert a row, uh, so as you get new matches, let's say you get a new second cousin match and you want to insert them, you can insert them into this sheet, um, inserting a, a, call, a row, sorry, a row. Um, and then you can always undo it. If you feel like you've messed up, up in the very top, up by the save button, there's a back arrow that's the undo button. And you can always undo whatever you just did. And you can actually undo, 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 and work your way back to something. Uh, if you think that you've made a series of errors, you can always keep undoing until you get back to where you were. So it's a really nice feature. I would also suggest that you save this file often um, because sometimes, uh, you know, you, never, you just never know if you're gonna have a blip you know, in your computer processing or if Excel is going to freeze or something like that. So just keep that in mind. It's, it's, a, it's just a good habit to be into to kind of save it as you go. So I will work on maybe one or two things and then I'll save it. And then I'll work on one or two things and I'll save it. And then pretty soon you'll find yourself in the habit of saving a lot. Uh, you can also wrap the text. And this is one that, I mean, for some reason, this one really bothers me when the text just covers multiple boxes and just keeps on going. So there is a button for wrap text. So basically what that does is it keeps all the text of that one line in the same cell. So you can see how over here, the link to compare column where the red arrow is, how all of that text is kind of wrapped around. It's not extending beyond. So I, again, will take that triangle in the corner, choose to select the whole sheet, and then I will click on wrap text so that every box has wrap text. It's just easier for me. Visually, it's better. Um, but you can make your decisions about your own spreadsheet. Um, and then I think lastly on our list to talk about with the spreadsheets of the major tools is that I generally freeze the top row. So what that means is that, um, and I've shown you instructions here, how you can choose view tab and then choose freeze panes and then freeze top row. And then what that will allow is as you're moving through the spreadsheet, you can keep that 
set of titles for kit and chromosome number and start position and end position. You can keep all those at the top. So as you're scrolling down and looking at, you know, maybe line number 240, you can still see those headings. So that's a really easy way to, um, to not lose track of the plot and what you were actually looking at. Uh, the spreadsheet also allows you to get back to individual results in, in Ancestry. These will post in, um, in the comma separa separated value file as a URL. So you can get back to that Ancestry result um, if you're pasting in Ancestry or back to that GEDmatch result if you're pasting in GEDmatch. Um, so it's important to keep those live URLs in your spreadsheet. That'll save you time from having to go back and find that match again later. And you notice if you click here to follow it, what'll come up, this is my cousin Cindy. So what'll come up is my cousin Cindy's match profile and all the other associated information with her. So it's really nice to be able to go back directly to the source when you need to, rather than go back and look it up. If you're going to download DNA matches from Ancestry that include family trees and, sh and surnames, it's actually, uh, for me, I build it, I build the file a couple of different ways. I copy and paste from the sheets for my most common matches. So I highlight and then I paste the results into Excel. And again, it has live links, so it takes, takes me back. Um, and I build a spreadsheet using that. And then the link that opens back up. So if I have that link and I have my dad pasted in there and I click on the link, it takes me back to my dad and it takes me back to the surnames that we have in common, um, the shared matches. Obviously we have a lot, but if you're doing this with cousins, you know, it's a really helpful tool. And don't forget ethnicity. You know, you want to make sure that you're looking at some of those ethnicity things too. Um, I've broken through a number of brick walls just by just by looking at ethnicity. We all know that that's um, that's not an exact science. Um, the ethnicity results, um, of course, if you've tested at multiple companies, you realize that it's sometimes not even close. But um, there are reasons why the ethnicity pops up here. And if you look at your results compared to some of your other matches, they're being based against the same reference populations. So it's possible that that could contain some clues for you. I use Excel for some other things too. So let me uh, talk about that for a few minutes. I use Excel to copy lists of ancestors and people that are in shared trees. So for example, I have a number of different people on Ancestry's website who have shared their trees with me. I've shared my trees with them, but also they've shared their trees with me. So when I go through the list of trees where they've been shared with me, rather than have to open each tree and search by name and try to figure out where the connection is or who, what family do we have in common, that sort of thing, what I do is I build an Excel spreadsheet from each and add in each of those trees. So let me show you what I'm talking about. Um, if you go to um, Ancestry, um, this is on um, my family tree DNA, or I'm sorry, my family tree software, family tree maker software. You can go to trees and you can go to create and manage trees and you can see all the different trees that are shared with you. Um, you can build a file from your shared trees. So there's a list of people. Um, you can type in, find a person, list of people, and then copy and paste that list of people into Excel. So this is the list of people that are all part of one tree in my family. And what you'll notice here is that there are blue live links that will take you back to each individual person on that tree. But at the bottom, what I have is a file of all the shared trees. It has live links. So it has, I have an Offenbecker Purdom tree that I've pasted in. I have a Pence family tree, a Perez family tree, so and so on. So all the trees that are shared with me, I have in one Excel file. 
and each tab is a different family tree that's been shared with me. It's fully searchable. I can color code it. I can make notes. I can live link back to whatever person was in whatever tree that's been shared with me. It's so much easier to use this rather than go item by item, person by person, screen by screen through the shared trees. I also download family tree DNA matches to Excel. So if you have family tree DNA matches, for example, mitochondrial matches, um, you can go to your mitochondrial match page. And again, I've redacted some things here, but this one is my mitochondrial results. And let's say, for example, I want to take the results that are in these three pages of, of results and I want to download them into a spreadsheet. You can look at the bottom of the screen for the bottom of the first page for download matches, um, either CSV or Excel. Now, I tried both ways and Excel acted a little funky for me. So I went ahead and did the CSV file and then changed it to Excel that seemed to work better. But depending on your computer, your software, and probably whether it's Mac or PC, one of the other of those is gonna work better. Um, so if you download as a comma separated value file, again, you get something that looks like this, a spreadsheet of your mitochondrial DNA matches, um, gen genetic distance, full name, uh, first name, middle name, last name, email, earliest known ancestor, and so on. So those will give you uh, a place where you can start to work. You know, if I have, it looks like 13, uh, 13 different um, full sequence mitochondrial matches, that's pretty amazing. So all those people are related to me, my mom, my mom's mom, my mom's mom's mom. So I can get to work right away with figuring out who are these people and how do they fit into my family tree. So that's a pretty interesting feature. Um, I will note for those of you that aren't as familiar with mitochondrial DNA matches, uh, unless you've done full sequence matching, it's not going to be as helpful to you because all it's going to the matches are going to do is is divide into two groups, and you know whether it's a group one or group two, it's not really going to help you in terms of of finding um, how those people are related to you. But full sequence matches are definitely going to show you um, genetic distance of zero. Those are all identical matches. And so it's like finding other people who are from the same, the same mitochondrial DNA line as your mother and your mother's mother. So it's a pretty cool thing. So I use the mitochondrial spreadsheet match. Um, I also do Y DNA matches, um, not for myself, but for my husband. Um, he has a Y test at family, uh, family, sorry, family D. <laughs> Where is my head today? Um, from uh, family DNA. And so he has um, Y DNA matches that are in a spreadsheet. And so what I did here was I looked at, let's put all of these in a spreadsheet as well. So um, if you look at the first page and then you scroll down, you will find again, download. And once again, on this interface, I use the comma separated value file, not Excel. So I made a spreadsheet of my matches. These are all his um, three and four matches. And he did a uh, Y37 test. And so the zero, one, two, three, and four are the only ones that are significant to him. And so those are the ones that downloaded. He doesn't have any zero, one, or two matches. That didn't surprise me because he's a first generation uh, German in this country. And so most of his matches are probably gonna be further back and further away. But um, this is uh, this is his list for Y DNA matches. Again, it gives you genetic distance, name, first name, middle name, last name, email, earliest known ancestor, and so on. So this is a chart that you can continue to use and continue to add to as more matches come in. You can download your 23andMe matches to Excel. So let's say, for example, you're working on a project with 23andMe and you want to move all of those matches to an Excel file. And that's your primary source, or maybe it's just an additional source for you. 
You can open your DNA relatives information under tools. So if you go to the tools at the top and then people, what you'll see here listed is uh, DNA relatives. And then if you scroll a little bit at the bottom, you're going to find download aggregate data. And when you download the aggregate data, what happens there is you end up with the same thing that we've seen before. You end up with a spreadsheet of your 23andMe matches. And this time it's a little bit different format because there's different information in 23andMe than there is in Ancestry or in Family Tree DNA. So your display name, surname, chromosome numbers, start and end points, and those kind of things, the SNPs in common, are all listed there. And again, you can see that there are links over here in column I, it looks like, uh, where you can link back to each individual person at a later point if you, if you want to find more information. So there's a way to download your 23andMe matches as well. Very, very helpful. And again, you can set the font size, the font type, the columns, bold or not, color coded or not, freeze the top row, all those things, wrapping text is all available for each of these spreadsheets. So you can make them all the same. You can make them all look the same. You can use Excel to compile some cousin charts. Now this is a little bit different process because this isn't an automated thing that happens. Uh, this is a spreadsheet that I made. Um, I'm working on a, a project with my cousins. So what I did was I have my dad and my mom, I have my son, my sister, my brother, and then I have my three cousins who are all siblings. And so what I did was I looked at all of the ancestry matches that we had. So there are matches for my dad that match both Bill and me, that match Cindy and me, that match Kathy and me. There are matches for uh, let's say my sister Jody that match Bill and me, that match Cindy and me, and that match Kathy and me. If you go further down the list, when you move outside of that initial um, me, my parents, my siblings, and then my cousin's siblings, then you have others, you know, just other matches that, that come in. And there are some who match to Bill and me only. There are some who match to uh, Cindy and me, some who match to Kathy and me. So I've, I've, what I've differentiated is that three set of siblings, Bill and Kathy and Cindy, I have checked off who matches me for all of those places as well. And that just kind of gives us a more uh, rich, fuller picture of who all the matches are and they only match maybe one of us or two of us. So you notice here, there aren't any who are in uh, outside of first cousins or second cousins even, who match all three of them and me. So once we get to the point where they have second or third cousin matches, I match some of them and each of them match some of them, but the four of us don't match all of them. It's a fascinating look at how, you know, DNA is recombined and, re and, and uh, split you know, in half each generation and how things are, some things are inherited, some things are not. Some cousins have more in common. Cindy and I have more in common with a larger number of people than my other two cousins, but they're all full blood siblings. So that's a pretty cool thing to look at. But this is not something that's generated by the tools that are in Ancestry or Family Tree DNA or 23andMe. This is something that I made myself just as a comparison. I also use an Excel spreadsheet um, to compile three types of DNA information in one location. Now I do this when I'm working with a client, but I also do it when I'm working with my cousins. And I found this to be really helpful to have something that we can share back and forth that has three different types of, of information in one location. And again, this is something that I'm putting in the input myself mostly, um, but this is the first uh, tab, the ancestor percentages. So this is, uh, this is my family tree, but this is my family tree from my cousin Bill's perspective. So Bill is the DNA tester and his parents and his grandparents and great grandparents and so on are listed here. Now, of course, his grandparents and great grandparents are mine. So we have overlap there. But um, 
We've also added in at the far right ethnicity information if we knew it um, or we thought we knew it. I should always say that. I should always qualify it. Um, we haven't proven every bit of this, but um, so this is who we have listed um, in our family tree. And I just made a brief mock up of the family tree. And this was something I keyed in. The second tab has Ancestry DNA matches. So this is a spreadsheet that I've been using with him. We're working on um, a DNA question for him. And so I've uploaded um, Ancestry DNA matches. I've looked at whether or not they have trees. I've also looked at in the far right column. Um, I've looked at the shared matches that we have in common. And then we have an unusual thing that happens between Bill's family and my family. My dad and Bill's mom are siblings. And my mom and Bill's dad are very distant cousins. So my parents are not related. However, uh, my parents, I can use to sort Bill and Cindy and Kathy's results because my mom is related to his dad and my dad is related to his mom. So wrap your head around that for a minute. But there are lots of ways to filter DNA. And I went on GEDmatch and I checked to make sure that my parents were not significantly related uh, in any way, and they're not. So what I was able to do was then say, look, the matches in this list that match my dad also match Bill's mom. And the other matches must be from his father because my parents are not related. So I've used my parents as a sorter for his DNA problem. I also added in some GEDmatch information. Now, for those of you familiar with GEDmatch, this was long before um, I had figured out how to copy and paste and build a spreadsheet out of GEDmatch. This is when I was keying in um, the patterns of where we had uh, start and stops on chromosome numbers. What you can see at the top is chromosome number one, chromosome number two in white. It goes one, two, three, four, five, and so on. It goes all the way to 22, and then 23 is the X chromosome. So I have those, and then I marked all the spans that we have in common. Now remember what I said way back in the beginning today. The interesting thing and the technical thing to know is different from just locating patterns. We've spent a lot of time in our childhood learning about patterns, looking for patterns, we start with color patterns, number patterns, counting. You know, think of all the ways that we look and categorize things. You know, I have a new grandson and he's seven months old. And we talk about things being those things are big, those things are small. Those things are yellow, these things are blue. And we talk about all those kinds of sorting techniques. We have all the skills to sort and look for patterns. So if you look here at the patterns, you can see there are several things that jump out right away. And the first two lines here in chromosome number three, from 61, 000, or 61 million to 67 million. Those are identical segments that we have in common between those first two people. If you look at uh, chromosome number four, the first person here, it starts at 6 million and goes to 40 million. But the second person starts much earlier at 61,000 and goes to 40 million. So there's some significant overlap there. So those are the kind of patterns we're looking for. Now you don't have to build a chart like this because we now have the ability in Excel to, um, to build a GEDmatch sheet. So you don't have to go through this laborious process. However, I did do this for a client project many years ago when GEDmatch was much younger and I was much more inexperienced with GEDmatch. Um, you can see some of the patterns from, uh, this was a client I was working with um, and she had people we had already identified as her mom's side, but she was looking for bio dad. And we were able to use a lot of this results to search and to uh, sort her whole spreadsheet of matches into mom's side and dad's side. Uh, you can download a DNA data file for GEDmatch. And I would recommend highly that you do. It's very easy to use uh, GEDmatch and jump back into their tool if you need it. But in order to be on GEDmatch, you need to um, open an account there and then download your raw DNA data file. You can find that on your DNA tab in Ancestry. It's in settings. 
Uh, Family Tree DNA has it, 23andMe has it. They all have the ability to download a raw DNA file. MyHeritage has that as well. So you can go into settings and download your file. Here's what it looks like for Ancestry, download raw DNA data. Um, just in case you're wondering, what we'll download is a file that's called a zip file. And a zip file, uh, before you upload it, you want to leave it zipped. Uh, you don't want it to get corrupted in any way. So leave it zipped for the upload. But then if you're curious about what's in it, because it is interesting, uh, you can go through the zip file and you can actually look at the results. But wait and do that till after you upload it to GEDmatch. And again, this is raw DNA data. It's sequences of base pairs that you get from each parent, what you've inherited from each parent at each locator. So you want to make sure that you keep that raw DNA data file in a secure place, in a locked file, uh, move it to a flash drive that has encryption, something like that. You don't want to just leave it out there in the universe, okay? So once you download that file, it'll be a zip file, and then you go to GEDmatch and you upload it. So what does a close match look like in GEDmatch? Uh, what I've shown you here is um, myself and my daughter on the left and myself and one of my sons on the right. Now my sons are identical twins, so I would assume that if I uploaded um, the identical twin that he has an identical result. Um, I'm in the process of testing the second twin and proving that, so I'll get back to you on that. But if you look at the left side for myself and my daughter, on um, chromosome number one, you can see what the full matches look like. Um, from the beginning to end location, and then you might be asking yourself, okay, why doesn't the start location start at zero? If she got a whole chromosome number one from me, why doesn't it start at zero and end at the end? The truth of it is that it doesn't start at zero because a lot of the DNA that we have isn't tested by the testing companies. So maybe on chromosome number one from zero point or the start point to 700,000, we have DNA that we all have in common. Um, 98, 99, maybe 99.5% in most cases of our DNA is the same for all of us. So the testing companies don't test that. They test the places where we're different. So that's the reason why we aren't starting at zero with many of these things. But these are what full matches look like. Um, I will note for you, for myself and my daughter, if you look at chromosome number 10, do you notice how it goes from 100,000 to 90,934,000? And then it picks up again at 90,947,000. That is probably due to a mutation. That's still considered to be a full match on chromosome 10. It's just a little blip in the radar, so to speak. Um, but I just want you to note that that happens. And if you look at my son's DNA matches to me, you will find on chromosome number one something very similar. There's a small blip around 102 million where it stops and then it picks up again. Happens again on chromosome number 10, much in the same way it happens with my daughter, it happened with my son as well. So there's probably some kind of mutation or something interesting going on there. But I just wanna point that out for a couple of reasons. When you're talking about how much DNA you have in common with someone, you might see this happen where you have a a large segment and then a blip and then another segment. And so it's really okay um, for analysis purposes to treat that as one big segment. You know, he is my biological son. And even though we have this blip on chromosome number 10, he has my chromosome 10. It might have a mutation. It might have a spot where the test didn't read or didn't report or something else crazy going on, but he still got a full chromosome number 10 from me. So that's something to keep in mind. Rather than looking at that as 108 and a 67 match, we, or a 65 match, we would look at it as the combined total. So those are some things to keep in mind. This is what full DNA matches look like. I think it's important to keep that in, in mind when you're talking about what kind of match you have to someone else. And if you have a 50 match, a 50 centimorgan match to someone, depending on the chromosome, that could be pretty significant. So a full match on chromosome 22 would be 79. So if you match someone 50 uh, centimorgans on chromosome 22, that's huge. 
So um, just to give you a little bit of perspective, I just wanted to include that information in here. So how do you use Excel for GED match matches? Let's look at that. Um, you can paste from GED match to Excel. Um, it's a little bit different process than it is for downloading from Ancestry or downloading from Family Tree DNA or downloading from 23andMe. This, you would go to GEDmatch, open up the spreadsheet, and then there are some steps here to follow. You're going to control all, which is select from GEDmatch, and then you're going to open Excel and copy to Excel and then paste it. But it's a special kind of paste, and I'll show you a screenshot of it because you want to keep the live links. So if you look here, the information that you get here, um, this is the default sorting by your spreadsheet. It's by chromosome number and start position. So it will always start with chromosome number one and always start with the lowest start position and then give you the information on your matches. So this is the tier one segment matching tool um, and that's on the pay side. And I believe that um, your DNA group is going to do a workshop about the segment matching tool. I'll probably be back to help facilitate that in the, in the upcoming months. But um, I've given you a lot of information on how to set up the spreadsheet, how to get to this point, and how to analyze the data using that, that tier one tool. Um, that was included in your additional handouts, how to set up the entire file. Um, in order to use the segment matching tool, what you want to do is sort it by centimorgan size. And you want to go from largest centimorgan size to smallest. And then what you will get is you notice that column number B, or column letter B, sorry, is now a mixture of chromosome numbers because what it has in this table is it has all the data sorted by your largest match. Now you can see that mine, this is my data here. Oh, I'm sorry, this is my son, Casey. So it shows how much of a match he is to John and to April. You see all these Johns and Aprils? Those are his grandparents. So of course you're going to see his grandparents listed in here. So what we want to do is we want to move down the sheet and find the largest Centimorgan match that's not his grandparents. And the first group that pops up is on chromosome number two. You can see on those three lines, I've circled it in red, that there are some 37 to 40 centimorgan matches, all in chromosome number two, all in the same region. That's a cluster of people that I need to look at because they're all related. Because my, I'm not related to Casey's father biologically, and my parent, grandparents, my parents, his grandparents are not related to each other. We can use that to sort. And so we know that on chromosome number two, we've got this grouping on chromosome. Uh, the next three matches that aren't his grandparents are, um, let's see, chromosome number three, chromosome 12, chromosome 16. And you see we go through the list and we look for the top matches that are not his grandparents. You may or may not have matches that are high like this, 40s. You may have 20s. You may have teens. Start with what you have. Start with what's the largest centimorgan match to someone that you don't know and use that to analyze. So you can go back and, sh and sort the sheet again by chromosome number and start position. And in order to use this tool effectively, um, and this is, this is just kind of a short mention of this tool, there's a lot more to learn about it, but you can go from largest centimorgan matches and who has the biggest pieces in common with someone and then go back and sort it by chromosome number one, two, three. So by chromosome number and start position and find the other people who match those same start and end positions and start grouping family groups together. It's a very effective way to look at, at groups of people who have a lot in common and then try the people who match one or one or both of two kits to build start building family groups. So there is uh, there are further instructions in um, a PDF that I have attached and and Kathy sent to your group called Segment Matching Tools: Steps to Prepare an Excel File for Analysis, and that will show you how to set up 
the tool, how to set up the Excel file, um, how to get onto the tier one side and pay your $10 membership for that month, um, how to download everything, and then how to go back and forth between the two versions. The one that's for, that is sorted by Centimorgan size and then the one who reverts back to the default settings. So there's a lot of information in there. We are going to have a class, I believe, in the future about that. So you can ask Kathy when that's going to be. It's not scheduled yet, but should be scheduled fairly soon. You can capture GEDmatch, GEDcom searches in Excel or in PDF. I tend to use PDFs for them because I find that's a lot more visually, uh, I can just right click and, and save it. So for those of you who aren't familiar on the free side of GEDmatch, you can look at GEDcoms. You can search for all the GEDcoms. You can search for a name within the GEDcoms. So I'm gonna run through a couple slides here to show you how to do that. Um, in the upper right corner of GEDmatch, it says search all GEDcoms. A search box opens. I would recommend that you just put in names to begin with rather than searching by birth dates and places or death dates and places. I usually don't add those until I'm at the point where I can't find anything that, I, that I'm looking for. Um, I put in just names because the more you put in, the more it's searching for and the more it wants to reduce your number of matches. So, so I put in here my, uh, let's see, my great grandparent and my great great grandparents and then what generates is um four different gedcom files that include my great grandfather william jackson todd and his parents samuel and nancy todd so these this uh gedcom that's listed here and again these are hot links so these will take you back to um, people in common, but it's a great way to sort all of the matches that you have in GEDmatch by all of these uh, different people to see if you, if you have any overlap between your ancestor and your matches. So this happens to be all uploaded by the same cousin. Bro Stacy is one of my cousins, and he has uploaded four different GEDcoms for four different, probably four different cousins of his, um, or four different kits he's managing. And they all link back to these, this set of second great grandparents, Samuel and Nancy Todd. So what you might wanna do is then go through these hot links and see who are these four people who also have the same uh, set of ancestors that I do. They may not be that person's second great grandparents, but they could be their first or third or whatever great grandparents, but somehow all of us are related. So think about family groups. So this is one way to do that. And then of course, how do you save this information? I tend to save these things as a PDF rather than pasting them into Excel. So what I do is I go to my print feature. So you can right click print or you can Control P print or however you do it on your computer. And when it opens up and it shows your default printer, you can click on change. And then what comes up is save as a PDF. So if you have a PDF software like Adobe, uh, the free version of Adobe Reader, you know, or something like that, there are different PDF softwares. But if you have any software, it'll save as PDF. And then what you'll get is um, a PDF of that uh, information. And don't forget to look at the details of the GEDcom. You get so excited that you have some cousin matches that you can build in a family group, but go through and open up and look at the information that's in that GEDcom because there's information about my great-grandfather here, his parents, his wife, his children. So anything that my cousin, uh, Bro Stacy, has uh, uploaded, you're going to find uh, here. I've uploaded and attached GEDcoms for every person that I manage in GEDmatch. And of course, the GEDcom for them is slightly different than GEDcom for me because there's a different starting person. I don't upload my entire tree. I just upload biological ancestors. Because again, if you think about it from DNA perspective, the only people that matter are the biological ancestors. So just the parents, grands, great-grands, and so on. 
Um, and of course, the assumption is that these people are who we think they are in our tree, but at least it's a good starting point. I make PDFs of other things uh, using that same process of right click print or uh, control P print. Um, I make PDFs of the one to one matches when I get a little mini chart like this and I'm testing one kit against another and I find the start and end location of where we have DNA in common. I will keep that information. It contains the kit numbers. I've redacted them here. You can't see them, but it's nice to be able to have the kit numbers saved so you don't have to keep like a running list or go back and try to figure out what was it I did. Um, so that's something interesting. Um, if you have uh, results of one or both of two kits that match, again, I make these PDFs. Um, and it includes the kit numbers and all of that, but it gives me an idea on chromosome number one, who matches, and, and I use these PDF tools a lot. It's a great way to communicate with cousins, particularly if they don't have GED match and they don't know what you're talking about. They can at least see where, you know, I match so-and-so and another so-and-so and look how we match. We match in these three places. It's a great way to figure out with your cousins um, which segments, DNA segments you have in common and where they might have come from. And PDFs is just a good way to communicate that with people. I make a folder for each project and what I've included here is kind of a redacted thing, but um, at the DNA day uh, that we're having in Columbus, and I'll probably end up recording something about this as well. It won't be recorded that day, but I've come up with a way to, to treat my cousin projects as actual uh, projects as if they were clients or in a way that organizes them so that I don't have to reinvent the wheel every time when I jump back and forth. I don't know about you, but I have dozens of cousins and they've all got projects going, so I needed a way to keep track of them. So this is a DNA project folder that I made for a client actually, and this just shows that I have a report. So for those of you that aren't familiar with the research report, we use research reports a lot, or we should be using them a lot for, um, for our DNA matches, but we should be using them for our regular genealogy as well. When we have genealogy questions or we go to an archive or we're researching something, it's just a great way to be organized. So I'm doing a class on this at DNA Day in January. So if you need further information about that, I know Kathy's emailed about it on your list. Uh, for those of you who are remote, just stay tuned. Uh, because I'll probably record something on this shortly. But I have here all the PDFs for the GEDmatch tools. So I label it as GEDmatch because that's the tool I'm in, and then a one-to-one -one tool, and then I list a little bit of information about what it is that's captured in the chart. I've numbered them so that in sequence the client can go through and go from sheet one to sheet two to sheet three and see what happened. Um, I also have some other things that I've captured the autosomal matches, the DNA segment matches that are Excel sheets that I include in the same folder. So a little bit more about this later, but there are ways that you can organize your files by folder on your desktop or in your document file where you can find everything you've worked on already with that one cousin or that one client all in the same place. You can organize in OneNote, and I'm not gonna talk a lot about OneNote, however, uh, May 19th in Columbus on a Saturday of 2018, May 19th, uh, we will have our second um, OneNote workshop. It's from 9.30 to 1.30. And if you want more information about that, you can email me, uh, Kelly, and I can get you information on how to register for that. But OneNote is just an on online digital tool where you can archive all kinds of things. So I've left a few things here about how you could use it for DNA. We're not gonna spend time really discussing that because that may not make a lot of sense to you, but I use it to cut down clutter, paper, that sort of thing. I have everything organized in OneNote. So you can keep uh, notes on webinars, white papers, blog posts, articles. Um, you can keep notes that you've taken on a DNA book that you've read. Um, you can copy DNA match lists. I've done this with my dad's um, genetic ethnicity so that I can see over time how it changes every time Ancestry changes their algorithm. I just think that's fascinating. But um, I also track GED matches and correspondence. 
So when I have correspondence with a con cousin like Bonnie, then I am able to send the email here so I have it all in the same place. And all of my correspondence with Connie is in one location. I don't have to search my email for it. And by the way, this is my email address, kbergheimer at gmail.com. So if you have any questions about what we've talked about today, or you have anything that you're curious about, um, definitely uh, you can contact me there. Or if you were looking for information about that, um, the workshops upcoming or anything like that, I can add you to the email list. Um, this shows a, uh, this is just a PDF of how Bonnie and I are related. And so she uploaded um, a family tree for me. And then I captured some of the things where we're connected on the chromosome segment matching. So of course it doesn't show here where we match. We match like in chromosome number 18 or 19 or something, I can't remember. But um, I've included those PDFs in that same folder um, that's, on, that's in OneNote. Uh, you can attach files to OneNote. Uh, you can do GEDmatch files. I have information on the Human Genome Project there. I have conference syllabi. I have all kinds of things stored there. It's an excellent way to be organized without paper and without notebooks and without files. And it's just a great way to have everything portable. I can read it on my phone. I can read it on my tablet. Uh, so it's, an, it's just a great tool. Highly recommend it. Uh, there will be probably workshops at the Ohio Genealogical Society Conference on OneNote or Evernote. They're both very similar. So if you happen to go to one of those conferences or NGS, the National Gene Genealogical Society Conference, almost always has a OneNote or Evernote class as well. It's a great place to kind of uh, learn a little bit about that. You can leave files as uh, attachments, and then as you update the files, you have a live link to them. So it doesn't mean that it's all static documents, but with so many pieces and companies and tools, we need to get organized. Figure out your file naming, figure out how you're going to store these things so that you can be more productive. And I'll just leave you with this thought. I checked Ancestry 23 and Me, Family Tree DNA, and GEDmatch, but I have no new cousins. I guess I'll check again in five minutes. So I'm sure all of you can relate to that. Thank you so much for, um, for, for attending this, uh, listening to this, uh, waiting for me to get a chance to record this. I appreciate it. I hope to talk to your group again soon. And um, if you need any further information, my email address is kbergheimer at gmail.com, kellyberghimer, and you can reach me there. Thanks a lot.